Ladies and gentlemen, Side Strafe back with some more DCS World. And today I've got a very special live stream highlight for you, featuring a QA with the senior producer at Eagle Dynamics, Matt Wagner. So special thanks to him for joining me and uh, answering a lot of my questions and especially your questions. You guys had some insanely detailed, in depth questions that he was able to provide a lot of answers for. Um, I've edited this down to provide you with the uh, the best questions and, and answers. Uh, we did have some Twitch difficulties. The entire website decided to go down, of course, uh, during a Q&A. And so I had to switch over to my iPad because for some reason the app would see the chat and the website wouldn't. But anyways, I did what I could. Hopefully this is appreciated. Uh, we might do this again sometime in the future. So... For now, please enjoy. Also, keep in mind that I am new to DCS, so, uh, you know, I asked what I could, but I really wanted the viewers to ask most of the questions, and uh, I think we got some good ones in there, so, enjoy! Bismarck says, P47 module, question mark. Uh, it's actually the next uh, World War II aircraft we do have planned. It's in development right now. Um, so yeah, it'll be the successor to the uh, Spitfire, which is our latest one. And uh, so it's kind of a divided effort right now. We're of course, um, you know, still working on the Spitfire, still in early access. And then in parallel that we are working with the, uh, the, um, uh, the Thunderbolt. Uh, the issue with the Thunderbolt is uh, trying to get access to really good data on that aircraft has been a nightmare. And uh, that's one of the reasons we've had a little bit of delay on that one. It's just that when we do one of these aircraft, we want to make sure they have, you know, all the possible information to get it just right. And finding that information, again, it's just been a nightmare. What's the, what's the average development time for a single aircraft, whether it be a World War II aircraft or a jet? Yeah, that's the thing. It really does vary greatly on the aircraft uh, between a uh, World War II aircraft and, say, something like a Hornet or an A-10. Uh, an A-10 or a Hornet, you know, that could run you, what, four or six years, literally. Um, a, a World War II aircraft, you know, maybe 12 to 18 months. Wow. So it, it really runs the gambit. And then also, you know, of course, um, it depends on, uh, you know, how many resources you can put against it as well in some areas. Um, so something like the Hornet, you know, right now we're able, you know, now that we have all the data finally in, we can, you know, put a lot of different um, engineers and artists against it so we can, you know, move much more quickly on it. Um, so, you know, given that we can move much more rapidly with the Hornet uh, compared to as uh, we did in the past. But then, of course, there will always be your uh, gating items, um, such as a flight model or, or some other very specific aspect of the module, which is usually tied to like a single uh, engineer. And, you know, sometimes you're kind of working at the speed of, you know, that item. Right. OK, so I see a server now. And... Now, as far as between and because, of course, you're working with different third parties, there's the mm -hmm. core Eagle Dynamics and then there's um, are the relationships different between like you and Bell Simtech and maybe some other. Are there any is it like is it more of a subsidiary is one a subsidiary or is more or is it like a strict third party or no, they're all fully 100 percent independent companies. OK. You know? Now, you know, we have a very long history with you know, Belsum Tech, and we've even actually um, uh, shared staff on occasion, uh, one, uh, you know, person leaving the company, going to work for the other. And, you know, also they're, you know, you know it's culturally and even um, geographically uh, very close to each other as well. So we've been able to work very close with them over the years, but, you know, they're a 100% you know, independent company. Okay, right on. Um, but yeah, I'm always interested in, in the amount of time it takes to, you know, to build these things and always trying to explain that it's not just, it's not like, you know, a typical game where the game takes a certain amount of years to create. And it's, you know, here you're looking at each aircraft taking several years. Right. Well, and also a big part of it too is, you know, when you do certain aircraft, you also at this, in the same time may have to develop all new technologies. Um, you know, for example, you know, in order to do the, uh, the Hornet, 
uh, we first actually did the update to the F-15 to do a, a transonic supersonic flight model uh, and develop that first with the uh, cooperation of uh, Bell Tech that we would then later use that core technology for the Hornet. Uh, and also at the same time, we also had to develop from scratch the air to ground radar, uh, which, you know, the, the basis of it is all done now. Now we're actually uh, implementing the specific uh, application of that technology into the Hornet's APG-73 radar. I'm sure that all made sense. To them, hopefully. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, see, and I, I think that's what I'm falling in love with is, is the fact that, and I remember people had always, I always knew about the title. I always knew about the series. And I always thought, ah, I just, I don't think I could do it. I don't think yeah. I could do it. And then you just... When you said, you know what, let me set aside a few hours and watch mm. a couple tutorials and yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe read a book or something. And mm -hmm. and then you realize, like, you know what, this reminds me of what computer games used to be like. <laughs> yeah, actually, it's one of the, the reasons I originally got into, you know, flight sims back in the mid-1980s was, you know, just that. Yeah, we were talking about earlier how Bell Simtech announced the MI-24 and the F4E. Right. So, um, yeah, we're particularly excited because, you know, as you might imagine, the uh, Phantom is going to be a great counterpart to the uh, uh, MiG-21. Yes. And then also having uh, MI-24, which is, you know, in many ways the brother to the MI-8. It's going to be really nice to have that in, in there as well. And actually, one of the nice things about uh, doing the Hind is it actually has a lot of the... Uh, same systems as used in the MI-8, so that will also help uh, you know, speed up the development time. Which again, that's another uh, element which can really uh, determine development time, is how much of uh, core tech and uh, content that you've done in previous titles that you can pull over to the next title. Right on. With, with that, you guys ever consider, like, I guess we'll ask first, how long does it take to make a map? Let's say Normandy, for example. Well, the maps themselves, yeah, it takes a while. But for us, the much, much uh, bigger item was, again, actually doing the core map technology. And we used the Nevada map as kind of the test bed to develop and test that technology. And um, so, again, the map itself, yeah, it took a while, but not nearly as long as developing that technology that supports the map. And you know now that we've got the core map technology, you know, uh, nearly there. Still some you know things we want to do with it. Um, developing future maps is going to go much much faster now. Okay, right on. Much faster now. So and we really do see maps as being a a core part of the product uh, as an equal to the aircraft down the road. And so you you might look at doing matching the theaters of war. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Oh, and, that, and as you might imagine, that was you know the core reason why we developed the Normandy map was to support the uh, World War II aircraft. Right on. Yeah, because I was thinking with all these kind of like Vietnam era mm -hmm. things. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and you know, one of the big reasons we did um, the straight or working on the straight horn moves map is to directly support the Hornet, which we think will be a you know really nice uh, combat theater for that aircraft. Yeah, I think I saw some stuff on that on, on uh, Reddit on the Hoggett Reddit or whatever. Uh huh. Yep. Oh, I'm doing a little bit of lawn mowing here. Okay. Yeah. Just let me know when you you uh, are airborne. I'll go ahead and roll behind you. I am up. Okay. Rolling. So, but yeah, now we have a lot of the um, the core map technology uh, working. We've been able to make a really good progress on the straight removes map, particularly lately. But we're also using a lot of the technology to really update the um, Caucasus map. Uh, let's see. How do you verify flight characteristics on your flight models, as in how a 109 would perform compared to a Spitfire? Uh, mostly two different ways. One, of course, is as you know, as we're just talking about before about getting the core documentation of you know flight tunnel test, uh, pilot notes, uh, all the engineering data as much as we can, uh, data-wise. Um, now, the trickier part 
which is, you know, to me, like half the battle is then having the subject matter experts of actually talking with and working with the actual pilots who have flown those aircraft. Uh, oh, now, wow. obviously, when you get to, you know, the older aircraft like a Mustang or 109, uh, it becomes a much more difficult proposition to find those uh, pilots out there. Um, uh, modern day, not so much. Uh, we got some really good uh, Hornet pilots. Hornet pilots we're actually working with right now, but the older ones, yeah, it's uh, much more problematic and it's more focused at that point on the documentation from that period. Okay, where are you? Uh, let's go ahead and circle back over the airfield and join up. Roger that. Guys, I have no idea where you are. I have to get used to the handling with the rocket load. Yeah, it's a little heavier now. But yeah, it's cool that you guys go through that much detail. I mean, even talking to pilots. Oh, yeah. To get it's, their feedback. It's a must because, you know, one thing we've learned over the years is that, you know, you can read and read all day, but until you actually, you know, talk to the guys who have flown the aircraft, it's really difficult to get the nuances and how the aircraft actually feels. Is there an ETA on combined arms for the World War II assets? Uh, not an ETA, actually. In general, we just don't talk about estimates anymore we kind of got burned on that in the past so you know once we feel it's uh pretty darn close then we'll go ahead and uh do an announcement with a release date at that point but um it's in work and there's a lot of really cool things we want to do for that but it will take some time though i'll go ahead and say that the that same answer will apply to any questions about the f-18 or any aircraft releasing yeah, um, just in terms of giving any kind of time estimates, um, you know, kind of uh, been there, done that, and uh, have the scars to show for it. And we're just going to, at this point, uh, focus on what we you know, know for sure 100% and go by that now. Yeah, I was telling you earlier, I think that I would probably upset people by because I remember that, <laughs> you know, that's how it used to be, the, the when it's done thing. And I think sometimes right. it's just like, you know, we're not making happy meals. It's yeah, and I totally understand. You know, obviously, you know, a lot of people are very, very excited about these products, and they want them in their hands as soon as possible, and have an idea when they can look forward to that. Um, it's just difficult because you know we want to provide that. In the past, we've tried to give our best estimates at the time, but you know, but they were just that. You know, our best estimates, and you know, unfortunately. Uh, what happens with software development is, you know, things change, people come and go, technologies, uh, you know, prove to be more or less difficult than expected, and, you know, other complications, and uh, things can change, sometimes dramatically, unfortunately. Yeah, no doubt about that. Okay. I'm coming uh, behind you probably about your 7 o'clock. Copy that. So now we get closer to uh, Shorborg. It's going to actually spawn those two 109s. Uh, question, what setup do you use, Matt? Uh, computer or like uh, control sticks? I imagine they're probably talking about your controls. So I'm using a, a Warthog uh, stick and then a Thrustmaster a TWCS throttle, which is kind of the closest thing out there to a Hornet throttle these days. And uh, I don't use rudder pedals. Actually, I use the rocker on the throttle as my rudder. I actually like that. That's pretty nice that yeah. they added that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's you know, very good for me in particular. Um, then uh, track AR and VR, of course. And um, I guess that's about it. Pretty simple. Is there a plan to improve the combined arms module or will it be kept as simple state as far as how it works? Uh, in terms of you know the level of fidelity, uh, pretty much the way it is now for the foreseeable future, um, you know first we want to you know, really improve the quality of you know what we're trying to do now, and there's definitely areas we want to improve on that. Now once we get to that point, uh, then uh, you know certainly we want to pursue um, some higher level fidelity, um, you know perhaps even do a, you know DCS level version of tanks and such. I was going to ask that next. <laughs> yeah, but again, it's it's more of a this isn't you know an announcement or a promise. It's just more speculation. Uh, again, right now our focus is just on improving what of we course, have right of now. Course. Yep. Yeah, I just want to. I can already see the forums where oh my god, Wags is announced they're doing DCS Abrams. No, no, yeah, I know. I was, I was I've always <laughs> been joking with my buddies because 
I, I love tanks. I'm, okay. I love tanks. And I was always yeah. like, I was telling my friend Joseph, I was like, we need DCS Sherman tank. <laughs> <laughs> where is it? I, where is, I'm ready to, I'm throwing right. money at the screen. Nothing's happening. <laughs> well, you know, certainly I think, no, but World, it's, War II, and I think World War II is going to make, you know, that much more possible, you know, simulating a high level fidelity Sherman or a Tiger. Sure. It's going to be a much uh, easier task than, you know, doing a an Abrams, a Leopard two, or a you know T ninety for that matter. That's always the issue because it's like, well, how much of the armor is top secret, and can we really figure out penetration values on right. new stuff? Whereas with World War Two, it's like, well, nothing's yeah. classified, and right. So, are you seeing me now? I should be I on see your you. four. Yep. Okay. But yeah, there's also that understanding. It's like, well, okay, it's not just a cockpit. It's a driver's seat. It's a gunner's mm -hmm. seat, a commander's seat, the cupola, exactly. the optics. The every, There's a lot of modeling and there is. detail in that that could take forever to build. Yeah, and the whole IVIS system and uh, the networking of all the different components. Any plans on building a H-64 for DCS? Um. I think it'll happen someday. It just, you know, right now, um, just our focus, you know, for us is on Hornet and for Bells and Tech, it's going to be on the hind. You know, again, not to say it won't happen someday. I think it will happen someday. It's just more of a question of when rather than if. Are there ever, I mean, and again, just bordering things that you might not be able to discuss, but I remember back in the day, there was issues with games like Battlefield using, uh, uh, Bell helicopters in their games right. under fair usage. You know they oh, never got they never got any actual permission or anything. They just used it. Um, like with well, you guys, are there are there ever any companies that you just that simply don't even want to sell a license or give a license or anything based on saying we don't want our things depicted in a simulated environment getting shot down or anything like that? Or uh, we're really having you know companies um, uh, seeking us out to. Uh, bring up those kind of issues but uh, on the other hand we definitely take uh, steps on our side uh, to make sure that we don't run into an issue like EA did with uh, Bell Textron and yeah we were following that case very closely <laughs> is the new caucuses map going to cause a greater impact on performance I would imagine in a way because it's yeah, well, it's hopefully it's going to be um, a zero-sum game, and that's going to balance out, given there's going to be a great deal of optimization. But at the same time, there's going to be a heck of a lot more detail, um, you know, much more detailed ground mesh, more detailed textures, a hell of a lot more forest and trees, you know, improved buildings. It's just, you know, there's going to be a long list of great improvements. But virtually all those improvements are, you know, either higher textures or you know, higher polygon objects. Uh, so... So you know, what we're you know shooting for is you know even with all these improvements the optimizations will you know all balance out. Right on. Yeah, I mean there's a lot going on down there and with the new lighting and shaders and. Well, another um, actually, so you were asking earlier about you know the Apache and you know, also talking about the Hind, and you know one of the big improvements that you actually you know, I'm not sure if you've experienced in this map is you know all the trees now are uh, collidable. They also have yes. Li yes. line of sight blocking for weapons and such. So you know that way you know if a triple A triple A gunner can't establish a line of sight to take a shot, well he can't fire the gun, and you don't have to worry about you know uh, the weapon passing through a tree. Um, so this actually makes helicopters, you know, a, you know, a heck of a lot more enjoyable and fun to fight uh, now where you can actually really take advantage of uh, the tree canopy and uh, terrain masking and that sort of thing. So um, that's another big improvement for the new maps is having, you know, that, um, you know, collision capability and that line of sight blocking. Yes, I've I've discovered firsthand that the uh, trees have a collision mesh. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering about that. So, have you tried out any of the helicopters yet? I have not. Funny enough, because I had bought that game, Rising Storm Two. Okay. And it had helicopters in it, but I was disappointed because right. they didn't have any joystick support. Oh, really? And so apparently, it's on the list. They they okay. might add it and stuff like that. But I was like, you know what? It kind of got me in the mood to to fly a helicopter, and I was like, well, okay. I, I looked up what games have a Huey or something. It's like, okay, okay. DCS pops up. 
Right. And so I thought that that would be the one that I started with, but then I, I think I got into IL-2 again, then I had the World okay. War II buzz, and then I uh, one thing right. led to the next, and I was flying the Mustang trainer, and then here I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll get you, uh, you know, started on the Huey sometime, once you feel comfortable with these aircraft. That, that would be awesome. I think I know where the trucks are, though, by the ship. But I'm probably going to get shot down, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, trucks were to the right. I think I killed the ship, though. I think you did. I was aiming for the tr the trucks, uh, okay. <laughs> but yeah, it didn't work out for me. <laughs> there's, there's a, uh, I think, uh, north to south wind. So I think that's what happened. You're aiming for the uh, trucks, or actually the other way around. So, but the ended up hitting the ship instead. <laughs> Oops. Okay, get my aircraft started. Literally the first day I've. I, I learned how to arm the rockets and fire them, but yeah, as far as actually putting it into practice. Yeah, it definitely takes practice. Not happening. First timer. Is there plans to make planes and helicopters with two seats allow two players in one aircraft? Isn't there? Oh, Chad already yeah. answered it, apparently. Yeah, I already do. So it's in the L-39 and the Gazelle right now, and we're already working on it for other aircraft um, for the future. What's coming? That's probably like F-14, uh, F-4 Phantom is two seat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I and, imagine. You know, I mean, also, you know, the Huey and the uh, MI-8. Oh, so the Huey's going to get support. Yeah, it's it's already planned. Just okay, a matter of nice. when. Yeah, yeah, again, of again, not an if, it's a when. Um, and then the Hind, of course, which would be really awesome, I think, for a, a cooperative multiplayer. Um, not a question, but I think you should make a duo seat plane for free so that new players pilots can get lessons and get excited about dcs mm. oh like yeah. well the t5 tf51 is technically a two-seater is there ever a thought of like making it an actual trainer plane yeah it's you know, certainly something we'd love to do uh, again it's finding the resources and the staff to sure. do that though and I, and I sound like a broken record here on this subject. no i know well you're, you're also getting a lot of the similar kind of question yeah. so i know it's well it's like you know, anytime we put a post on our forum or facebook um you know usually the next 50 posts are well what about this or what about that and you know again everybody wants something and it seems a little bit different and um but we do a fair amount of posts though of you know polls and things like that and we do you know read uh voraciously you know our customer feedback to see what's most popular and what most people want right and that certainly is a you know huge factor of the direction we go and the modules we select to do and you know the hornet and the uh, street of Hormuz map you know were key parts of that and a lot of those you know choices were based on customer feedback are there any good books in the office that you and your team uses to reference material that's a neat question. Yeah, it is a good question. Um, well, for radar, we usually use Stimson's uh, Airborne Radar Guide, which is you know incredibly handy uh, a tome to really understand the workings of uh, airborne radar. Uh, that's probably one of the, the bigger ones. Um, use a lot of the Jane stuff, of course. Um, those are most of the, but most of the references are you know the standard you know. For Navy aircraft, the NATOPS for the in the TAC manuals, then for the Air Force, you know the Dash ones and the Dash 34s. So most of our offices and my office here are mostly full of you know those type of manuals, and that's where most of my reading these days is. That's pretty dry, but it's you know for me kind of interesting. I suppose, especially in your position, you're having to, you know, study up on each thing, and and it helps with making the tutorial videos, and it does. Yeah, so you know, you're anytime, constantly in school, <laughs> pretty much. But even uh, in my previous line of work, I used to work in combat aviation, so I studied a lot of this stuff in the real world. Oh wow! Uh, I had a hand, so you know, made the learning curve quite a bit easier. Yeah, no Wikipedia. That that might be a few other games, but not this one. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> They're joking. No, whenever I'm online and I see someone, you know, reference Wikipedia as a source, it, um, you know, kind of the credibility goes to the, the basement at that point. 
<laughs> yeah, time to exit. Uh, follow up question about two seats. Would it be possible to make that second seat on a train? Oh, trainer like the L39 free so that you can't fly it on your own if you don't own it. But the L39 owner could invite a new player to fly with him. That would make trainer planes like the L39 sell better, I would think. It's it's something we talked about, but really no plans at this point. Do you have a favorite aircraft that you guys have developed so far, or a favorite module of yours? Or uh, for me, it's probably the A10 still. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, kind of my first. Uh, well, not my first, but you know, my baby, so to speak. I shared with them earlier that uh, that forum post that had the picture of the damage model comparison. Oh, the, right. Uh, for the World War II stuff. Yep. And I was I was blown away by it. I mean, just the difference is night and day in terms of how many things they're showing in the plane. Yeah, well, we definitely recognize that. You know, this, that's one of the biggest uh, limitations of DCS and DCS World War II in particular right now, and it's something we're putting a lot of um, resources and time against. Uh, to improve uh, greatly. And the nice thing is, even once we get that done, that'll translate well to, you know, the modern aircraft and even the ground vehicles at some point. So it's, you know, it's, you know, those type of tasks that really have a you know, huge, huge impact on the game for, you know, for, you know, eventually all modules, but also for almost all players right. are the ones that usually have the highest priorities for us. And that's a lot of it comes down to is, you know, when we, you know, work on something, whether it's a bug or a new feature or something like that, it's, you know, is this going to, you know, tailor to just a small handful of people or something that, you know, the broader DCS community can, you know, really appreciate. And um, you know, a lot of times people have their own, you know, pet peeves and they can tend to be, you know, quite vocal. And it's, you know, and it can be a little tough sometimes that um, not trying to, you know, distance ourselves or ignore, you know, a bug. It's just sometimes we have a higher priority, you know, bug or bugs that need to be resolved first that, you know, have a much bigger impact on the entire game. Right on. Yeah, I was going to ask that as kind of a follow-up as far as the damage model for the World War II craft and how mm -hmm. similar it is to the modern jets. So you're saying that the damage model stuff also relates to the, the, new, the new, new jets? It will. Right now, we're focusing the, the new damage system for the um, the World War II stuff. Okay. But it, but eventually, obviously, we want to make it apply to everything. All right. Yeah, because I didn't know if the the jets were on a different system or something. No, a very similar system. Okay. So, it, it, you know, it's definitely an area we can certainly improve upon. Is there anything like specifically that you wish more people could know about DCS that doesn't seem to necessarily come through when, mm. like? I mean, I obviously tend to fend off a lot of the is this like this game type questions on my own even, but is there right. anything that you wish, oh, I wish these people could know this about DCS or? Well, I think, you know, I think it's probably something that you can identify with is that I think a lot of people have this impression that it has this, you know, monumental, almost vertical learning curve that, you know, only the hardest core or the hardest core gamers can really enjoy. Right. Whereas, you know, if you want to play that way, you know, you absolutely can, um, you know, but we also have aircraft like the, uh, I know it's a really weird name, but the Flaming Cliff series, yes. which is a much more relaxed uh, simulation where you don't have the, you know, the full clickable cockpits, things are much more simplified and, um, you know, and the learning curve is much, much more shallow and you can have a lot of fun with those. Right. Uh, but even after that, you can also really tailor the gaming experience to you know put labels on unlimited weapons unlimited fuel unlimited damage and you know many many different cheats to also make it you know not an arcade game but um pretty darn close right. if that's what you want to play it that way as well so you know you know certainly dcs i think it you know has a reputation is known for you know having that you know really high level of detail and steep learning curve but, you know, if, if it's not something you're interested in and you're more interested in the really cool graphics and uh, gameplay and things like that, we well, can certainly tailor the game to, you know, meet that uh, expectation if that's what you want. Speaking of that, I noticed there's that, like, game mode 
or mm -hmm. or, or set of settings. How, right. What does that actually change within DCS? Uh, well, the big thing is you can you know go to the cockpit if you want, but if you you can play from like a, essentially over the shoulder point of view, and it puts like an easy radar. You know, it has icons for all the targets around you. You essentially have buttons to you know cycle you know next and previous targets and automatically locks onto them. So it's um, you know very much almost like a console game okay. uh, type of uh, environment. And then also generally the uh, flight models are more relaxed, so you're not getting yourself into a spin uh, as easily as you would in the real aircraft or the real uh, simulation level. Um, I'm dead. So, <laughs> oh, triple A. I was gonna. I was attempting to kill the AAA, okay. but that was a bad idea. Ah, <laughs> uh, oh yeah, bad idea. Because I was like, well, maybe if I get rid of them, we'll have less problems. <laughs> well, they got rid of me. Uh, Matt, what are what are some of the most fascinating air battles throughout history for you? Hmm. Hmm. I think maybe some of the uh, linebacker operations, particularly when the, more of the gloves were off at that point. Um, you know, to me, that's some very interesting reading. Um, so yeah, I think linebacker one, linebacker two, for me, were probably the most interesting. But again, I'm, I'm much more interested in more modern day. Right. Um, you know, ODS and such uh, was you know a bit of a baby clubbing seal exercise. Uh, but also, uh, 82 war was also a very interesting, uh, uh, study in modern combat, but again, also more of a shoot, uh, a Turkish shoot than anything else. And Falklands too is also a very interesting, uh, study. Any book titles that you would recommend for anybody interested in some of what you mentioned or? Hmm. So I just got done reading was it called viper pilot i thought that was a pretty good read and before that i was reading actually i think funny enough it's called hornet pilot <laughs> and um also good read as ods but i think the viper pilot one was more in um uh uh operation iraqi freedom and it was mostly focused around seed operations which is pretty interesting You heard it here, folks. New bestsellers. <laughs> Wagner recommended. Uh, Admiral Reese, will we see an update to bomb splash damage? For now, it doesn't seem like there uh, really is any. Oh, it's definitely there. Actually, I was just t testing it, funny enough, the other day, <laughs> where I was testing uh, rockets, actually the, uh, the uh, HVR rockets uh, against trucks. And they were definitely, you know, killing trucks when they weren't having direct hits. Uh, there may be some tuning there, but um, it's definitely there. It just may need some tuning um, from weapon to weapon. But also, I think part of the issue here maybe is that and this actually goes back to the damage model we we're talking earlier. Whereas uh, right now uh, the vehicles either have a um, you know essentially an alive model, a burning model, or a dead model. There's really no in between. Right. So even if you have some damage on the vehicle, you may not necessarily know it uh, due to splash damage. So that may be also contributing some of the confusion that maybe it actually was damaged, but maybe the player uh, had the health bars off, they didn't realize it. Okay. But again, I'm not saying that there's uh, some weapons that may need to be tuned, there certainly could. And when, you know, obvious cases um, of some splash damage errors are there, and we'll certainly take a look at this. So when you went from the one point, now the two engines, like, is it two separate engines? Is it, how much did you build from scratch to going into this 2.0 version from 1.5? How much is brand new as far as, like, the architecture or, or the tools for the devs? It's, well, both of the, uh, we'll call them engines, use a lot of the same assets. So that's why uh, it, look, it may look very similar because it's using all the same, you know, uh, 
assets, be it the models and the textures. Right. But um, a lot of the underlying code, uh, particularly the lighting, is very different now. The multiplayer code is you know, quite divergent now as well. Um, but then the whole rendering uh, pipeline is radically different now as well. And, you know, and also how the maps are structured is very different uh, too. So that's why we can't just, you know, throw the Caucasus map into DCS uh, you know, 2 because it's built under the older 1.5 engine right. and it, it would just look absolutely awful. Okay. And run awful as well. So that's why, you know, the biggest... Um, uh, thing we're waiting for to do what we're calling uh, 2.5, which will merge everything finally into a single build, is updating the Caucasus map so it'll work under the new uh, DCS2 engine. Oh, okay. And that'll, you know, I think make a lot of people happy, particularly us, because, you know, trying to support two different uh, essentially engines and product lines at the same time is just an absolute nightmare. I think it'll it'll help ease the transition because currently with 2.0 you need to have either Nevada or Normandy, correct? Correct. And I I, I think the Caucasus will be still like the game's free map even into 2.0 or. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, we have to have a free map, and sure. you know, so the reason we're improving it, uh, you know, greatly as well, so it'll give you know a nice good impression impression to new users coming into DCS. So we do you know believe that having a you know really good looking Caucasus map combine that with a free 25T and the free TF51 will you know be a you know pretty nice experience for someone coming in for the first time. So correct me if there are sponsors, or, but is there any not plans for a dedicated sponsored multiplayer service so the players can be more I'm not sure. Yeah. If that's, uh, I'm not sure what he means by the word sponsor. Maybe are there official Eagle Dynamic servers? Official? No, everything is unofficial right now. Okay. Now you know we are you know you know it's been a while. We start are still you know certainly working on dedicated uh, server technology, uh, particularly which will allow you know people to run you know servers remotely and without having to have you know the simulation up and running. Uh, but it's still in work, and you know again a big part of uh, uh, 2.5 has been getting that aspect ready as well. Okay. With that, I guess so. So basically, any servers that we see. You can't go to like uh, one of those gaming server host provider websites and buy a server for DCS and or rent one, I should say. Well, a, a private, or, uh, you know, you know, any customer, I, I assume they probably could. It just wouldn't be, you know, paid for and administered by Eagle Dynamics. We'd have no, you know, official uh, capacity and involvement with that server. Well, I mean, you know how there's like those hosts that you can rent servers from. Like, if you wanted mm -hmm. a Call of Duty server or something, you could, right. you could pay for one for a, from a third party. Oh, I D see. You're you going can't right. rent a DCS server from any third parties currently. No, correct. Okay, okay I see you're going right. Yeah, yeah. But the tools are out there for you to have a box and just run a server, and that's pretty much what we're connecting to currently. Ex okay. Exactly right. With that is. How much of the game is 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 there currently multi-core support? Is this a 64-bit client? Is that the future? Uh, we've actually been 64-bit for what three years now. Okay, right on. And in terms of multi-core, right now it's using two cores. Um, but we're certainly actually well, that's all I can say about now. But okay, things will change. Cool. Um, I don't use SLI anymore because I found mm. a lot of devs just didn't support it because granted right. sli users is like a tiny percentage of of the computer right. world right even though but i don't know if stuff like i don't know if the game currently supports sli or will or uh we, we're still working on it uh it's one of those Same issues thing, that, yeah it's it's been problematic uh and like you said um the number of users out there is using sli are pretty small yeah but it's you know something we definitely do want to support. But again, it's been problematic to um, work well within DCS. Speaking about updates, etc., would it be possible in the future to get full change logs for updates? Using the last update as an example, there were a lot of changes made that were not mm -hmm. shown in the change log that was released to the public. Is there a reason why change changes like integrity check are not included, and only things uh, pertaining to the aircraft? 
No, that's a good question, and it's certainly an area we need to improve on is, you know, more completeness in that change log. Uh, just more than anything else is probably just a breakdown of communication in that case, but certainly nothing intentional. Yeah, I guess I've always wondered, like, whose job is it at the dev to write the whole change log? Because some of the change logs are huge. It's like, who, you always wonder, I guess. Yeah, so what happens is every time we make a build, we essentially have an internal change log. Right. And literally everything is in there. So it's really, it can be like, you know, 1,000, 2,000 items in there. You know, anytime any, you know, of us, you know, go in there and commit a change to the trunk. Um, so you could be, you know, looking at massive change logs. So then it's a case of one of, her, one of her producers needs to go in there and essentially, you know, go through this massive list and find uh, the most pertinent items to take out of that and put it into the public change log. And fortunately, what happens is sometimes when you get these really massive lists, you know, things unfortunately um, just get missed. It's really as simple as that. Is there any official word that I see including terrain mods the the word was ED is discussing a more user controlled integrity check. I don't know what that is. Yeah, so basically we're, a while back we implemented an integrity check so that when users make user mods, whether it's a, uh, you know, a new texture, a new sound, that those aren't used then in multiplayer to essentially act as a cheat. So we've been you know, taking steps to try to, you know, uh, improve the integrity check to you know, reduce cheating within DCS world. Uh, but recently, in a uh, recent patch, we um, I think in increased it even higher, and it's um, you know had some uh, some negative feedback from some of our customers uh, because some of their mods don't work anymore. So it's something we're looking into, and you know, as always, we're taking all that feedback feedback to heart, and we'll try to you know. Uh, adjust the integrity check so uh, we can make as many people as happy as possible while you know trying to make um, it possible to have all their favorite mods but at the same time um, trying to eliminate you know ways that people can use that system to cheat which is always a you know, fun balance oh yeah there's yeah. always somebody out there to ruin your day when it comes to that it is so uh, I have no patience for cheaters it just unfortunately just ruin, ruin it for everybody As far as mods, I've noticed there are some out there. Generally, you guys are cool with like people doing sound mods and yeah, yeah, yeah. As long as they don't charge for them, um, you know, as long as everything is freeware, we have no problem with that. We think it makes the you know the community and the product better. Well, I tried to kill an AA thing. Took out my engine. I'm still <laughs> I'm floating. Okay. <laughs> I'm gliding now at this point. So I think we both are on that lesson. <laughs> I was like, maybe I can get him. What goes into deciding if a developer gets a third-party license? Uh, so hold on one second. Sure. Take it off. Need all my brain power. <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, so whether it's a aircraft third party, a map third party, a campaign third party, uh, they first have to demonstrate that they can... Sorry. Uh, do quality work. So we actually have essentially a checklist of things they have to provide first uh, to make sure that you know, they can do you know quality product. So for like an aircraft, you know examples of the external model, the cockpit, uh, some examples of the cockpit functionality, um, you know a basic flight model, that sort of thing. Because um, you know after years of experience, um, our uh, essentially our list of criteria that we have to see satisfied before we can give a license has grown quite a bit. So uh, we can ensure better quality of third-party products that we release under the DCS brand. Right on, that's always good. Cause you see like a lot of the, it's nice to see the consistency between right. the planes. I guess ideally it should look like it's one developer making everything if, yeah, if everything's being done right. And that's our goal. Obviously, you know, different teams have different art styles. So there's always going to be, particularly from an aesthetic point of view, there's going to be, you know, a difference. And you can actually already start to see that through some of the products. Um, but in terms of the overall quality level, we need a better level of consistency. So that's why we're kind of moving towards, uh, you know, much more stringent checks before you even consider a uh, license. Uh, a 
while ago, ED added wing flex on some modules and improved mm -hmm. wind tip vapor. Wing tip mm -hmm. vapor? Can we expect, mm -hmm. can we expect, especially with the Hornet, to get over wing vapor at some point? Yeah, it's definitely on the to do list. Actually, um, yeah, it can do over the wing with a Hornet, but actually, it's more of a, over the Lex more than anything else with the Hornet. I think you made somebody very happy. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, that's very that's very iconic for that aircraft. Yeah, all these answers, by the way, are being very much appreciated. No, no by problem. Me glad and, by me and them. Okay, well, I'm glad to help. Well, it's it's also nice when you actually find somebody that knows exactly what mm. you know they're talking about. And... Yeah, it's just you know it's always interesting you know doing these Q and As because you know um, you know, we were talking about earlier about time estimates, right? And there's always you know that difficulty of you know trying to um, set expectations realistic um, and not. But at the same time, not providing too detailed in terms of particularly release dates and such, because again, they're just estimates, right? And just you know, trying to better manage expectations, because I think in the past we probably could have done that better. So we're trying to be a bit better about that now. Well, it's appreciated. I mean, when when you can recognize that as a developer and say, mm -hmm. you know what, there's something we can improve upon. I mean, that's that's oh, always that's always great. Yeah, and and I know um, you know there are probably a, you know a few people roll their eyes on this, but you know we really really do um, want and encourage good constructive mature feedback because it makes a better product, makes us a better developer in the end. So you know, and that's one of the reasons I reached out to you because you know some of our um, initial uh, contact you gave me some really good constructive feedback that I think. Actually, it has improved the product in uh, a little way we talked about earlier, and um, and that's appreciated. Um, you know, the key is you know keeping you know the feedback uh, constructive and useful and mature, and you know the internet being the internet, unfortunately, does it always happen, and that's the frustrating part. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it t it totally goes back to to what we were talking about earlier with having an understanding of game development and in a way right. i mean going from the days where there was no internet and it was just there's mm -hmm. the box there's right. you know that's it uh mm -hmm. and it's like okay well you either take it or leave it but now it's right. like there's so much ex yeah. accessibility to to the dev and to the customer yeah. and oh yeah so I, I started doing this in 1998 at ea Jane's, and it was you know just kind of the earlier early start of message boards and things like that. And uh, even back then, a lot of the issues and problems we see with the internet today, you know, I can even remember seeing it back then as well. So uh, so it's not like it's really gotten, I think, that much worse over time. Honestly, I think it's just pretty much stayed the same. It's just you know, obviously the number of people contributing into the online discussions has obviously grown uh, dramatically. Right. But like, yeah, like you said, it used to be a lot simpler too. You, you know, you, you build the box, you put the manual in it, you, know, you do a update maybe once every few months, and that was pretty much it. That was your game cycle. Uh, it's you know obviously quite a bit different now, where you know, it's, you know, like us at Eagle Dynamics, you know, we're generally putting out a game update maybe once every you know, you know, one to two weeks now. And it's just you know a very different environment now. Yeah, no doubt about it. I, I mean, I think I remember, I mean, it was either, you know, A, you're not getting a patch or maybe mm -hmm. like later on, I think I remember right. you could snail mail somebody and they might mail you a floppy disk with a patch. <laughs> yeah, I remember, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, also to be fair too, um, you, know, you know, back then you really didn't have early access and things like that where- Alpha you know, was an alpha, beta was alpha, a beta. Absolutely. Yeah. Whereas, you know, you know, you know, us and other developers now, you know, like to give the op the option for people to do the early access as well. And, you know, for people who do want it, don't want to do the early access because they feel it's beta testing, well, then obviously they can wait till the final product. Right. But, but even when we do the early access, I think, I think unfortunately, there's still some of that expectation that, 
even though it's an early access, you know, people expect it to be bug free and feature complete. And, um, you know, that can ruffle some feathers as well. Because, you know, and again, it kind of goes back to what we were talking earlier about, you know, the earlier days of product when it went to the box and went to the store shelves. You know, generally, you know, even at release, it was you know, relatively a complete product. And in the days of early access, you know, that's, you know, not so true these days. Yeah, no doubt. Um, what is... but, but again, going back, I do think early access is a good idea. Um, I think it gives you know the customer the option of you know if they're a really big fan of the game and they want to you know help test it and get an early look at it and play around with it you know they have that option to do so, but if they don't want to be a beta tester and they don't want the frustration of bugs and things like that you know, then they can wait. I think that's the problem though, is that people forget that they have a choice. It's like well, yeah. you know they've told you yeah. it's early access. Now right. granted, there are some devs that perhaps do the wrong thing with it and maybe. Mm -hmm you know, not deliver a completed product or perhaps right. decide that they're going to sell an, you know, something else to go along with something that's mm -hmm. not right. complete or whatever. But mm -hmm. I think, you know, again, it's just kind of like, look, you know, we said it's in this big blue box on Steam. It says early access. It's right. not done. It's buggy. It's, it's your choice now. And so, right. but I think, you know, we become more entitled. We become... Mm -hmm we could armchair developers and <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, well, but, but it'll be interesting for us because, you know, we will be releasing Hornet in early access form. Um, you know, it'll be you know, essentially, you know, unguided weapons except for air to air weapons. And um, I think, you know, most of our core consumers uh, will enjoy that. But, you know, I'm also, you know, kind of expecting a, a fair amount of uh, uh, blowback from you know folks being upset that you know it doesn't have the air to ground radar yet or it doesn't have jdams and harms yet so i don't know it'll, it'll be uh, curious uh, to see how this all plays out in the end and so again you were you were saying some aircraft are potentially four or five years of development on a single aircraft yeah hornet's a good example but most of that was actually in terms of actually gathering the data right. and the research. And that just took a very much longer uh, time than we thought it would. Because uh, eventually, early on, we we're going to do an earlier version of the Hornet, which is actually a much more simple Hornet. Uh, but then we really wanted to do a, it's a, called a lot, which is like a, um, a group of aircraft built uh, within a, um, uh, almost like a skew, think of it that way. And we want to do a late lot to include more, uh, you know, cool and advanced weapons like, um, you know, slam ERs and latest version of the harm and GPS guided weapons and the, the helmet mounted sight and things like that. And, um, you know, given it's, you know, relatively recent um, technology, it, it took us a while to find all that information at a open source level. And it wasn't until we actually got to the level where we could really um, knew we had all the pieces in play that we could really push hard on it. Uh, what is the possibility of using third-party sound companies to improve the sounds within DCS? Uh, right now, we actually have our own internal sound department. So I really don't see us using a, a third party at this point. Okay. How does a lot of that where you guys try to get out to the... like? That is, I mean, I guess that could be tough because where do you go that's going to be like, hey, can we record this jet or this old? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, it really depends on the aircraft. You know, right. for example, the World War II stuff, you know, because, you know, uh, part of our company is the fighter collection. You know, we actually own a lot of these aircraft, you know, like Mustangs, like Spitfires. We okay. can just, you know, bring our sound engineer out to our hangars at Duxford and record in first hand, which actually... Uh, literally, one of our guys was at Duxford last week recording Spitfire sounds. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Now, other aircraft, you know, like uh, the Hornet, um, where we actually had some cooperation from Boeing, where we got, you know, all the samples we needed, uh, can be a little more difficult. Um, so it, it's possible. And the other thing I've noticed, too, is... Uh, we try to make them as accurate as possible, whereas some of the stuff third party I've seen, it tends to be a bit too Hollywood for our, our taste. Right. A little, a little too exaggerated. And um, it's not, I'm not saying it's bad, it's just different, but it's not the, um, the way we really want to go for our sounds. 
Does the game engine itself going from the 1.5 version of the engine to the 2.0 affect, did anything change with audio in terms of how it handles anything or? Mm, that's actually a good question. I, and I don't know. I don't think so, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Because I know with sound, a lot of times it's like the environment. So you fire a gun mm -hmm. indoors, you fire a gun outdoors, and then it's going to have a different sound. And so sometimes how do you capture a, Absolutely. a plane firing right. in the sky unless you kind of... <laughs> yeah, so I mean, for example, for the, uh, for the 50 calibers for the Mustang, we actually got the actual, you know, no-cating samples of 50 calibers firing and then did that for six and then did different effects based on, you know, wearing a flight cap in the cockpit and so on. But, you know, all of it's based on the actual samples of a 50 cal firing. Uh, is there any update to A2G or A2A weapons on the horizon? I know you guys have talked about it in the past, but there was nothing mm -hmm. ever said after the initial announcement of the weapons being reworked. Seems like DCS is still lagging behind in the simulation of in the simulation of drag guidance, et cetera, in comparison to other sims like BMS. Will there be an update to things like the AIM-120 and AIM-7 when the Hornet releases? Ooh. Um, I guess it's a, a two-part answer. Uh, first, I think there's a lot of, I can probably get hot water on this, so I think there's a lot of misperception about the actual performance of some of these missiles that they feel they're, they actually overestimate the capabilities of some of them. And I'll leave it at that. Um, regardless, we actually hired a new weapons engineer, and he's first working on the air-to-ground weapons, and then after that he's going to tackle the air-to-air -to, -air to see if we can improve those at all. Do we have any changes or upcoming plans for the mission editor? Uh, in the mission editor wise, probably some more triggers and that sort of thing. And we're actually giving a all new skin, uh, make it look a lot more prettier. Uh, those are probably the two biggest uh, things we're looking at uh, editor wise. Yeah, so uh, going back to the missile thing is, and also I think there, a part of it stems to the fact that I think there's a uh, different interpretation of data so there's some information out there about max range, min ranges, RTRs, and things like that. Um, but a lot of that is without the context of you know altitudes, closing ranges, launch speeds, and things like that. So de depending on how you interpret the data, it can actually uh, the data can be you know quite accurate or it can be quite off. So it really comes down to how you interpret the data and how our engineers interpret the data. Uh, one of which is actually a former missile engineer, is a bit different than some of our community members uh, ah, yeah. believe it should. Yeah. Let's see. The Fur Ninja High Wags. I heard rumors Yo. that SU-27s and SU-33s per peer data link won't be added until it gets an ASM. Is this true? I've never heard that. No. Um, I... I've never heard anything like that. There you you know, having having a uh, peer, uh, you know, essentially a, a fighter data link within multiplayer, uh, certainly something we want to be doing. But whether that being uh, something as part of the ASM, I don't think any such decision has been made on that on that front. Is the new glare that was introduced in the last patch one point? 5.6 on the HUD and MFD in the flanker intentional. It makes the HUD completely unreadable. Just wondering if this was intentional and is true to life or something that you guys are working on fixing. No, it, it's it's very much work in progress as part of the new um, uh, deferred lighting and uh, physical based uh, rendering system we're doing. Uh, actually, even internal versions are already pretty much fixed and looks uh, much, much better. It's just a essentially an internal, not internal, a interim uh, bug. Uh, right now, we're working out with a, uh, the new lighting system, but cert certainly nothing that is supposed to be like that. It's it's a bug. It'll get fixed. Is that kind of related to the thing I was asking you about the the the, the gun sight glass on the Mustang? 
It is. So okay. so the, uh, the screenshot I sent you shows what it looks like um, in the internal build, which will then be later be, later be released. Uh, hopefully in not too distant future where it definitely fixes that. And even in some of the um, images or in videos I released earlier shows the, uh, the Hornet. Uh, you can see we actually kind of added that realistic um, magenta coating to the HUD. Uh, which is just like in real aircraft, you know, to you know make the symbology much more visible, and also cuts down on that uh, real re reflectivity um, off the uh, HUD. So it was interesting though, is when we started to add more and more realistic lighting, we actually ran into the exact same problems that HUD designers ran into the real world, and we actually had to take the exact same steps to make the symbology visible. Oh wow! Yeah, it was just kind of show we were on the right path, which was nice. <laughs> I was wondering if ECM and DCS was expected, expanded upon, even in the far future with directed or deception jamming, or is this something countries don't like to share info about? Yeah, that, that's a good question. It's a tricky one because you know, this, this is one of those few areas that you know, I do worry about going a little too detailed and having a black helicopter show up, particularly because <laughs> they used to work in this uh, realm. And... Um, you know, we may do it someday, but I'd have to see some really good, very public information uh, on that before I would even consider uh, suggesting the team look into this. Um, there are certain areas we just have to be very, very careful about. I could imagine. And also, again, we've had you know contracts with the U.S. Air Force and the British MOD, so we're just very um, um, <laughs> careful about uh, systems that we model within the, within the game. Oh, <laughs> I heard that. I'm somehow still. I almost crashed my him. plane. <laughs> I was strafing a guy with guns, and I got a little too close to the ground, and somehow recovered. Ah, nice. But I am. Oh, never mind. There goes the wing. <laughs> uh, question similar. Could we expect ECM things without changing the effects like ECM only broadcasting its strobe when locked instead of consistently barraging? So actually, um, I think even right now, maybe it needs to be adjusted a little bit. We have essentially two different types of um, electronic attack EA within the game. There's barrage jamming, which is what we started with. Actually, kind of goes all the way back to lock on. And then we have um, essentially uh, SP self, or SPJ self-protection self jammers which it'll let, let you lock, but as soon as it detects the lock, it'll uh, essentially use you know, a some sort of SPJ, um, whether it's a, a blank jamming, a, some kind of a decum to break that lock. And I think it depends on the aircraft right now, if I remember right. I think, I think the A-10, for example, uses um, uh, an SPJ, whereas some of the older, maybe lock-on aircraft still use the old um, barrage, um, uh, noise jammers. But yeah, eventually I want to move all the modern aircraft to SPJs instead of the um, uh, noise jammers. The only thing you should really be using the noise jammers or, you know, maybe some of the uh, larger aircraft. And of course, you know, uh, like if we have later a dedicated uh, jammer aircraft, uh, like an EA-6B or something like that, of uh, you know, having that as a um, possible jamming mode. Can you either confirm or deny if there are any plans for any Red 4 carrier-based fixed wing into the future? Uh, we have the SU-33, which actually is um, right in the middle of getting a full flight model update and a bunch of new systems as well. And, you know, that's, um, uh, I'll just say close at this time. Any plans for releasing a modern Russian full fidelity module in the near future? I'm not sure what that means. Uh, not, not in the near future. You know, being a Russian company, it's a, it's a little more complicated for us to do Russian aircraft now. Uh, unfortunately, I just have to leave it at that. Okay. Update in the are we going to see an update in the future for explosion effects, as in like ones used in air-to-air -air missiles? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's um, so we talked earlier about some of the big things we're working on uh, moving forward to the big merge of 2.5, and the biggest being the updated Caucasus map. Probably number two on that list is going to be the new explosions. Nice. 
and then also uh, working on new clouds as well. And hopefully that'll be uh, with the new uh, big release. Right on. Because you know, because personally, I, when I see you know really great videos, when I see but when I see the explosions in the clouds, you know, it kind of makes me suck in my teeth a little bit. But you know, it's, those are two big items we want to address here in the not too distant future. Uh, will the Hornet get twin pylons? I have seen footage of Hornets carrying 10 AIM 120s plus two AIM 9s. Yeah, and actually I think in the one of the demo missions I released actually has uh, that shown with two AIM 9s on those uh, dual pylons. Uh, what is planned for carrier ops with F-18 or more detailed carrier ops in general? Yeah, right now I can just say, you know, because this is, you know, still very much in flux, it's just much more accurate and detailed carrier ops than, you know, what we have now, which, you know, won't be hard. This is more of a personal question for me. I've dealt with a lot of Russian developers. And, okay. Um, a lot of times it's not a pleasant experience for me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I'm not trying to, like... Do you feel that? Do you feel the cultural difference in terms of their ideas versus your ideas, or the way you envision something, or how? Well, there's, de there's definitely a cultural difference, and there is different uh, some differences in you know how ideas are expressed. But you know maybe because I've worked in these guys for like almost twenty years now, um, it's I really don't give it a second thought. It's just, you know, like with any culture, you know, whether it's a Russian culture or right. a Japanese culture, uh, Mideast culture, it's just um, it's just a different way of dealing with things. And you know, I don't want to get too much into details. Sure. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, once you understand the culture more and you understand the boundaries and, you know, what's acceptable and what's not and, you know, how to interpret uh, different statements and actions, it makes it a lot easier. It just, you know, it just takes that, I think, time. In familiarity with the team and the individuals. Oh, it's not a triple A site though. Damn it. But yeah, with any uh, culture, if you you know go into it blind and really don't, you know, first you know kind of understand why things are said or done the way they are done, then it can um, you know maybe be a bit off-putting. And there can certainly be um, a lot of opportunities for miscommunication. Of course. So you just have to be careful. Yeah. Um, yeah, but most of these guys on the Russian team are, you know, some of my best friends now in the world. That's good. Yeah. They're good guys. Really good guys. I've always said that there's probably not any... And I always think about the little guy at the studio sometimes too, like the guy in the mm -hmm. cubicle doing whatever. And I always think that you know, there's probably not usually somebody at the studio that wants to go in and say, you know what I want to do today? Make a horrible video game, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and so some, right. but sometimes yes, there's that other aspect of publishing or investing where it's like, well, you need to do this because this is what makes money and so on and so forth. And, yeah, and that's one of the reasons I'm glad that, you know, Eagle Dynamics is a privately owned company. Right. So we we don't have, you know, just, you know, stockholders making, you know, game decisions about what we should be doing and how we should be supporting it. You know, what is that? No, it's a flag piece. Okay. Um, so we don't have that pressure and that, uh, sorry, AAA again. Um a directive, you know, essentially from above, which particularly when it comes to, you know, release dates and such, um, makes a big difference where you don't have a, you know, a large publisher saying that, you know, you will release this product by X date um, regardless. And I've seen way too many games get pushed out way too early because of that. And, you know, that's always been, I think, one of the things I appreciated most about, you know, working for these guys is that when it's time to release something, we do it when we feel it's ready, not somebody else. Nice. Uh, I think there was a question that people are yelling at me about. Uh, will there be dynamic campaigns for the game <laughs> with more procedural type mission generation? Um, again, I think it's, you know, it goes back to one of these, not uh, if, but when. 
And also it's a, a big question of staff and time about having someone on staff who could actually do something and do it really well, which we really unfortunately don't have right now. Uh, but, you know, hopefully in the future where, you know, we have, uh, you know, the proper staff and the time and the resources to do something like that, right. you know, cert it's certainly something we'd, we'd love to do. It's just, you know, right now we don't have the resources and the people to do it. But, you know, maybe, you know, hopefully someday that will change. I think that's kind of what I like. And it kind of reminds me of Elite Dangerous in a way how it's kind of mm -hmm. like work on one thing, polish it, mm -hmm. finish it next then the next thing one at a time where there's sometimes i feel like mm -hmm. you can uh go too far too fast and be mm -hmm. all over the place uh, with development to the point where it just ends up with a giant mess and nothing is finished and mm -hmm. You know, and I understand why that can happen as well, because, you know, a lot of times, I think this is one of the biggest misperceptions I see when I read online is that, and, you know, obviously, it's, you know, folks who, you know, never worked on a software development team is that, you know, the same guy who's working on flight models is the same guy who's working on the texture art, who is the same guy who's working on uh, blast fragmentation. You know, you have, you know, very clear demarcations between, you know, different specialities of different staff members. So, you know, what can happen is, you know, let's say you're working on a you know, new aircraft and it's, um, you know, it's almost all done. But, you know, there's a, you know, you know, a certain amount of bugs in a certain area that, you know, just, you know, a couple of programmers need to, you know, spend time and fix up. Um, which is, you know, all well and good, but there's no reason that, you know, all the other folks that are not assigned to that should be, you know, sitting on their hands at that point. Right. They need to, you know, move on and start working on something else. So I think that, you know, partly kind of contributes to some of the perceptions I see out there of, you know, thinking development teams are, um, you know, working on too many things at the same time and not getting things done. Um, and there, there may be some of that. I'm not saying there's, that never, never happens, but you know, from my own experience, usually when I see that, it's because um, maybe folks aren't quite understanding that. Um, you know, it's you know, we have like a rather large team, and sometimes you know, we have you know people that have completely finished their tasks for a certain project, and they need to start you know, moved on to the next project. Okay, so I'm still over the uh, the port. Still haven't died yet. Yeah, I just I think, flew by it. I think there's still one AAA around here somewhere. And I think I just I think oh I see you. Yes. Are you are you running on that AAA? I was trying to see if I could. I don't see another one though. But oh, I see him firing at you. I don't. Oh yeah, I don't know where he's at though exactly. Yeah, I'm trying to follow the, the tracers. Try to just speed out of here and see if. Oh no! Gosh, there. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, where is he? Oh, is that him? No, I'm definitely dead. Where are you? I think that's him. I feel bad for that neighborhood. Are we going to get a proper mission planner kind of like in BMS? Um, I don't know. With, without definition, what they mean by uh, what is this BMS thing? I don't know. That is that Falcon, I think, I, uh, or I, something, or something related to that. I don't know.
Isn't it like for like 19, 1998 or something? I was watching. I guess there's a what's one of the third parties has a Facebook for the. I was looking at. The, I was telling you. I was looking at the Harrier videos that they that they're posting. Oh yeah, Razbam. That's looking pretty interesting too. Yeah, he's doing. Uh, they're doing some really great work on that. That's uh, definitely one of the uh, the, uh, the modules we're looking forward to getting out here uh, for this year. This is just me asking a, a, a piloting question. Is it harder to hover a jet than it is a helicopter? <laughs> Based on the, I mean. Well, for me, I found hovering the Harrier a lot easier than hovering a helicopter. Just because you're not dealing with uh, the, the propellers, I guess, in a way. Yeah, you don't have the uh, uh, the rotor torque and everything uh, trying to spin you the other way. Will we ever see either third-party or community-developed terrains? Will those tools be released? Eventually, yeah. Um, you know, just like the uh, aircraft, we first have to have, to have a very mature, uh, stable uh, tool for the terrain, just as we did for the aircraft, before we could give it to qualified third parties. So, you know, once we do reach that. You know, we certainly want to, you know, look at having, you know, qualified, you know, uh, third parties that can do really quality maps. And, you know, like I was saying, I think, God, near the very beginning of this uh, uh, marathon it, uh, live stream <laughs> is, you know, eventually, you know, I'd love to see the, uh, the maps play just as important role as the aircraft in DCS World. No, I just, you know, really appreciate you, uh, you know, taking the time and, you know, chat for a while. And, you know, also this is, you know, a good opportunity for me to, you know, talk a little bit about the product outside of the, you know, general uh, channels. And, you know, also, you know, f folks that may not be familiar with DCS World, you know, maybe it's a, you know, good opportunity for them to maybe learn a little bit more about it. And, you know, we have the uh, free version they can download from the site. And maybe they'll be interested to, you know, Take the time to download it, try it out, and, you know, see if they, see what they like. I think it's safe to say if the, if if I could get into it, then then anybody can. I thought for years I avoided it for years. I was like, no, right. there's no way I'm going to do it. There's no way I can do it. And now I'm addicted. <laughs> now I have a problem. <laughs> <laughs>